So for me, definitely a long period of time where I was dealing with substance abuse. I was abusing alcohol and drugs to try to have a really good time because my life was boring and mediocre and I wasn't able to fully be myself in it. So I was kind of running away from this, this life that was just so not me. And it was slowly trickling over into it. So like if I was at a family dinner, drink, 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 and I get too wasted and then, you know, stuff would come out. And I had all these issues with my family back then because I would end up having to do that. Or I'd be out all weekend and it would be say father's day or whatever it was and i wouldn't be i wouldn't come home because i was t- too busy getting wasted and being with other people than then then to care about you know what was going on in my family welcome to the queer quest podcast your beacon of light and sprinkle of glitter in the queer community i'm your host cristiano green ceo and founder of queer quest and a transformation coach for queer individuals and together we are embarking on a journey of transformation each week we bring you a new training topic or connect you with visionary queer leaders in healing and coaching diving deep into conversations that inspire growth celebrate diversity and empower you to live authentically so wherever you are settle in and let's get ready to unlock the vibrant potential within this is where your quest begins hello all you fabulous souls and welcome to another episode of the queer quest podcast I'm your host, Christiana Green, the CEO and founder of Queer Quest and Transformation Coach for people in the queer community. So on this week's episode of the Queer Quest podcast, I am having a solo episode and I'm going to be talking about substance abuse related to the queer community. I'm going to be talking about my own personal journey with substance abuse. I'm going to be talking about the differences between, you know, substance abuse and addictions. I'm going to share some of the facts and some of the statistics. And I'm going to talk about, you know, how I was able to work through my issues and how I helped so many of my clients work through their issues and why it's important for us to kind of look at this because I, on my own journey, I mislabeled myself as an alcoholic as in that I had an addiction and that kind of played with me thinking like you know I had this there there was something wrong with me now I'm not saying that there are people out there who aren't you know alcoholics or or addicts right because there are people are right but I also know what it was like for me going through the mislabeling and having to kind of feel like I owned a label that really wasn't me and just having to work through that on my own journey um of the ups and the downs throughout that experience so I'm going to be sharing that there I'm going to be talking about other things because I also know that the queer community is vast and, you know, not every single, you know, subsection of our community is going to have the same things to focus on. So I'm going to be talking a little bit differently about some of those different areas and, and, you know, and and also like intersectionality and how different cultures affect things in different ways. So we'll talk about that. So when we're talking about my own journey with substance abuse, the main things that I definitely struggle with in my life had been alcohol and then of course there was a period of my life where it was also you know party drugs so for me I started drinking you know around the age of 21 when I started to go out to the gay clubs when I started to try to fit myself in and see what this lifestyle was about before that pretty much I spent most of my life you know hiding away in my bedroom you know like no friends no social life literally just going to work, coming home and and hiding away because I was in the closet and growing up my experience, you know, I experienced a lot of bullying and I dealt with a lot of kind of internal traumas around my own self-worth, feeling very worthless um, as well. So then when I kind of got myself out of the the closet and started to live a, a separate life, meaning that I had my, you know, my life back home, I was living in my parents' house, where I really didn't have much of a relation with them, was hiding from them still. Um, And then on the weekend, I would travel down, you know, an hour and a half to Sydney and I would let loose and go to the, to the, to the, to the, to the party scene, to the clubs. And, and I got into drinking and then eventually got into, you know, taking pills and GHB and marijuana and all of the things, right? We, you know, there's, there's, a, there's so many layers there, right? I think we all can understand and relate to that, especially if we be, we're in that world or we've been in that world, right? So me 
what happened is, is I, I ended up getting caught up into this cycle because the people I would get out, like my, my, the, my friends that I, that I was meeting at the time were, were definitely people who would be going out every single night and partying. So basically binge drinking was in Australia is a big thing. And so for me, I got caught up in the binge drinking and pretty much every night that I went out, most almost every night I would end up getting blackout drunk and get wasted, right? Because we would we would go to someone's house first, we'd have all these drinks, um, then we'd go to the club and then we'd have some more drinks and maybe take something else uh, and then, you know, get absolutely wasted, right? And so but there were so many of my nights where I ended up like having blackouts. And because everyone else around me was doing these kinds of things as well, that was just a normal way of doing things, right? But I didn't really realize that I was actually utilizing these things to kind of numb myself from my normal life, right? I was still in the closet there. I was still hiding and I wasn't ready to, you know, talk to my family about those things there. And so, like I said, I was numbing uh, and myself and coping with those things, but also trying to have fun and just trying to figure out who I was. So I was just going through that whole cycle of like trying to explore myself, but also run away from things or kind of like have this middle ground. So like, if I didn't really want to do it, I could run it, go back home and no one would know, you know, it's kind of like that, that kind of way of doing it. So yeah, so literally get absolutely wasted, do that, then go home and life would be normal. And that would happen and happen. And then eventually, you know, the weekend started on the Thursday. So we have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then eventually it's like five, six times a week. I was out every single week, every single night. And it became this thing of like, you know, a problem. I mean, the amount of times, um, you know, I picked my friends up who've, who had to go to hospital or I've had to go to hospital. I've been to hospital five, six times, six times um, from taking too much, right? Um, and like I said, it became normal. So like, I didn't have this part of me or people going, what are you doing? Because it was normal. Everyone was like, oh, you're okay. You're right. You'll get back on it. And then, you know, I'd leave, you know, you'd leave the the, the hospital and you'd, you'd go back out and you keep going, right? Because that's just what everyone was doing around me. Now it sounds trashy, but that was the life that I was. That was a different era, right? I don't think that stuff would happen today. Like like the club scenes, you know, especially in, in Sydney completely changed. They changed all of these laws probably for people because there were people like us continuously having to go to hospital because we were ODing and stuff like that. Um, I'm sure there's still some of those that, that stuff out there, but I, obviously I don't, I'm not in that world anymore. But like for the last few years that I was going out, I realized there was a big shift and a big change. But the era that we came from, it was normal. This was what everyone just would look after each other. You'd have a good time and you'd keep going. You'd keep it moving. So for me, definitely a long period of time where I was dealing with substance abuse. I was abusing alcohol and drugs to try to have a really good time because my life was boring and mediocre and I wasn't able to fully be myself in it. So I was kind of running away from this, this life that was just so not me. And it was slowly trickling over into it. So like if I was at a family dinner, drink, 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 and I get too wasted and then, you know, stuff would come out. And I had all these issues with my family back then because I would end up having to do that. Or I'd be out all weekend and it would be say Father's Day or whatever it was. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't come home because I was too busy getting wasted and being with other people than, than, than to care about, you know, what was going on in my family. That's one of those things, you know, you look back on and you go, I wish I was there for that. But I also understand that like where I was at internally, I was dealing with these other things as well. And, you know, better to not go home wasted than to go home and cause a problem on say Father's Day, right? That was my kind of thought process for that as well. So they're yeah, dealing with that. And it got over the years, it kept going and going and it predominantly got worse. I just remember so many weekends I'd come, you know, I'd, I'd come home on a Sunday afternoon or, or late Sunday evening uh, or, or even the next day on the Monday. And I would just be so like, I felt like I was in a, a deep depression. And I know that probably is partly to do with coming down from some of this stuff. I also feel like, you know, it was like, I'm in this cycle and I can't break it. And it just kept going on week after week, after week, after week, after week. Um, and there was some, definitely some amazing highs, but you know what happens when you have the amazing highs? You have those low, 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 low lows. And I couldn't feel like I felt, I could feel like I was yo-yoing, like I was that pendulum swinging back and forth. And I just wanted to kind of meet some myself in the middle ground. Now, I've done many things over the years to try to kind of sort out my drinking, you know. There was periods of time where I was like, if I can just get through a week. And then it would be like four or five days and I would have a drink with someone. I just have one drink and then I get 
wasted again. So I went through the cycle of trying to stop there as well. And then, you know, I, I went to, you know, I did a, a like I did an ayahuasca retreat in Peru because there was a, a few real rock bottom moments where like I'm in a hotel room and I'm like on the floor, like crying my eyes out going, oh my God, like, why am I doing this to myself? Drinking like a bottle of vodka straight, like shot, shotting it as I'm on the floor in, in absolute desperation, you know, like those kinds of low, low moments. And so I ended up going to Peru and I did this real deep work on myself. And after I left there, I didn't drink alcohol for three, four months. It was over a hundred days, right? So I was able to say, say to myself, like, you can do this. Unfortunately, I went to say like a wedding with everyone. I got carried away, decided to have a drink. And then again, I got absolutely blackout drunk. And then I felt like I had wasted all of that stuff. And so then I went back into this lower, this shame period of like, you, you, you told yourself that you were going to stop drinking and you did it. And so then I spiraled and, in, you know, to, to, to counteract the shame that I was feeling towards it, I kept drinking. I got back into a cycle of doing that again. And that went on for another, say, two years. Um, and then I finally was in, it was, it was the beginning of the pandemic. I was at home. I was getting absolutely shit faced because so much stuff was happening. I was working in corporate at the time. I had a team of 100. I had to turn it into 300 within like a month. And like everything was stressed and so much was thrown at me. I just wasn't handling myself mentally or physically. And I was literally, like I said, getting absolutely wasted from, the, you know, I was even drinking at work sometimes. I was sitting there in the afternoon just with the mug, having my, like some red wine while I'm in a meeting. Because they didn't want someone to see what it was, right? Um, but I was just, I wasn't coping. And so I got to a really, really rock bottom moment. And I had to tell myself, look, like you don't need to go off to Peru and have another ayahuasca treat for you to stop drinking. You just need to say to yourself, this is, this is it. And you need to start walking on the things that you've been running away from. I've been running away from a lot of pain, a lot of trauma, a lot of anger, a lot of sadness, a lot of anxiety. Like one of the main reasons why I would drink a lot was because I kept feeling anxiety. And every time I felt anxiety, it was my way of dealing with the anxiety, it was to cope with the anxiety, to numb the anxiety, it was to have a drink and just feel that moment of oh, I'm feeling relaxed, the anxiety is gone. But then it would creep up because if you have a blackout again you go what the hell did I do last night and you cause all this anxiety to come about so I was doing this big, this big cycle so I had to get to a point where I said look it's time for me to work on those things and so when I was in the middle of, of that like, that first period of the pandemic I had that those those rock bottom moments and I decided that this is it I need to sort it out and so when I was at home instead of spending my weekends drinking I decided to sign up to all these different personal development courses so I did Tony Robbins and I did Brenda Bouchard and I did John D. Martini and Grant Cardone um, and just all of those little things that they, that they have on in between. And every time I went to those things, I started to work on some of these things that I needed to do for myself. I got myself a therapist that I was working with at the time as well, because my luckily, my because the, my work knew that I was stressed and in this position, they paid for me to have a therapist through, through work. So I started talking to someone else. Then I got a coach as well. And so I started to do all these things that were helping me and work through a lot of the stuff. Right. Um, and I realized that a lot of the stuff, you know, I wasn't as crazy as I thought it was. I was talking to the first that are like, you, you're, you're dealing with a lot of stuff. Like, let's unpack it all. And same with the coach. They started helping me in these different areas when it came to, to, to being ready to, to leave. Because there was this big part of me that had wanted to start my own business and help people in the queer community for many years. But I didn't have any belief in myself. I, I had really low self-worth. Even though I had a great position in the corporate world, I still didn't believe in myself that I could step out and do my own thing. And that really held me back from necessarily like getting what I needed to, to get out of, of that. And so, like I said, went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for quite some time. But like I said, I, I was able to work through these things with the coach, with the therapist, and doing all these different personal development courses as well. And then along through that, I was doing other small little therapies. And I, every time I got interested in something, I would learn about it and try to do that. And from that point on, I went over, I, I, I like, I did this massive year of personal development and healing and like really was able to overcome my own beliefs about myself, my own self-worth, um, like myself for the fact that I, you know, was that at the time 30, 35 years old and had never had a real long-term boyfriend outside of a couple of months, maybe six months was the longest, right? And so I felt like, you know, am I unlovable? All these things, I had to change all that stuff. I took myself out of even worrying about dating and I just focused solely on me. It was one of the best years of my life, really. Like, I remember just how inspired I felt, how motivated I felt. 
how like on board with it I felt. And I just remembered like I started to feel and process emotions that had been stored in my body for a long time. And like just if I was ready to cry, I cried. Whereas before I would not allow myself to cry at all, you know. And throughout that time period, the only thing I was doing was a small little bit of, you know, like taking some THC oil things, right? I was doing that just as a way of like allowing myself if there's any periods, just take a little bit of CBD or whatever. And that was the only thing I was doing throughout that period. And it just helped me to, I was still there, but also just allow myself to process some of these things as well. So allowing myself to do that. And then I completely got off of everything um, altogether. And then, you know, maintained a period of like of quite a few years where there was no alcohol. Um, there was no, of course, there was no other other substances or drugs because after I stopped drinking, I didn't get onto any of the other drugs, right? Like, you know, that early part of the pandemic when I was drinking a lot, I was taking, I was taking like, you know, I was doing other party drugs, right? Um, with people who would come around or whatever had happened, you know, what silly situation I got myself into after drinking. Um, but yeah, I, after that, I said, look, I need to stop. And I haven't done that for over four years now, which is fantastic, right? So I feel like I've been able to work through that, right? Whereas before, it would be a weekly occurrence, sometimes multiple times. You know, I'm talking about ketamine. I'm talking about GHB. I'm talking about pills. I'm talking about even, you know, meth as well, right? I did all of those things when I was at my low points. And then, you know, I started to go through this journey of going like, is this an addiction? Because I actually, at one point, I also was, for, for the first 100 days of me not drinking, I went on to the this thing called gay aa which is gay um, alcoholics anonymous and they were doing calls online because it was a pandemic so every week i was having one of the call i was just joining their call because it was like um they had a few calls but the only call that i could really make was one on a tuesday night and i would go there every week just to keep myself on track i've got to go there and then i also had a sponsor who i had to call at the end of the day and just say hey i'm good rah, 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 rah. like this is what's been happening and basically almost it ended up being that i ended up you know, being the sponsor for him in a sense, because he was struggling more with it than me. And so I was calling him saying, yeah, I've had a good day. I feel this way. And he's like, oh my God, I've struggled today. And I was like, okay, like, I, I don't mind helping you out. It was just funny that I was got, you know, you were you're supposed to be my sponsor and ended up being a flip of that, which is totally cool. It just meant to me that like, you know, even those signs there in the moment, I just felt like I was really being really strong and working hard towards, you know, not drinking. Um, but you know, even he said to me, because I don't think you're an alcoholic. And I, at that time, I just kept saying, yes, I am. I struggle with alcohol so much. Like, da, 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 once I drink, I can't stop. Da, 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 da. And so I had that belief that I was, I was labeling myself an alcoholic and I couldn't drink. So then, you know, after a, you know, a, a long period of time of me not drinking, I said to myself, look, I want to test this out for myself. Like, I want to see if I, if I go and have, say, one or two drinks, what's going to happen? And now, when I first had that, nothing happened. I realized, that, okay, like, blah, 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 blah. And then there were some times where I had it, and then I had a few too many. And I was like, okay, is this about, you know, finding the right balance, or am I actually an addict? And I realized that, as I continued on my journey, that, one, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't feel like I'm addicted to alcohol. I don't crave it. I don't have these days where I'm like, oh, I need to have a drink, or I struggle to not have a drink in a day. But there are definite times when I know that if I am having a bad day or having a bad week, and if I was to choose alcohol, I know that like it would be harder for me to stop myself from having, say, just one or two. I'd want to have more. And I'd have to really rein myself in to stay in that spot. But also, if I'm in a good spot, like really do I even feel like having a drink? Like, you know, I don't drink that much. Maybe I'll have a, a drink here once a month and it might be on an occasion right now. Like for example, today it's my anniversary with my partner. We're going to go out for dinner and I'm going to have a margarita at dinner to celebrate because, you know, that's something that he likes and I like, we'll have a margarita together. I don't think that's a big deal for me to have a drink at dinner, but it won't lead to having two, three, four, five or six, right? That, that's where it's at for me. Whereas if I was the alcoholic, I wouldn't be able to have one because if I had one, I want to have 10 and then I would fall down a dark spot so I can manage it better. I can handle it. And I can also be around people who aren't, who are drinking without me. Like, you know, recently I went out with my, to, to, with my partner and some of our close friends and there was four of us. 
they were drinking, they drank quite a bit, you know, they had quite a lot of wine and I decided not to drink because, you know, I wanted to, to drive home and I also wasn't feeling like it, but I had, a, I was able to have a good time. Of course, I'm on a completely different level and they're like, you know, doing their drunken talks, etc. But I was able to, st- to just chill and do my own thing. And so if I was an alcoholic, that would, that would have been a struggle for me. I would have wanted to do it. I probably would have had one and things wouldn't have turned out the, 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 the right way. But I was able to say no. Because I know to myself, I'm not an alcoholic, but I do have a history of substance abuse, especially with alcohol. And of course, in the past, you know, with with drugs. Now, in a world where every journey is unique, one path shines brightly for the queer community. Introducing QueerQuest, the first of its kind personal development platform designed exclusively for us by us. At QueerQuest, we understand the multifaceted journey of queer identity. That's why we've created a space where you can explore, learn, and grow with the guidance of queer experts from around the globe. Whether you're seeking to enhance your physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual well-being, QueerQuest is your gateway to transformation. Imagine embarking on quests tailored to your journey of self-discovery, finding community, and unlocking your queer excellence. QueerQuest offers online courses, coaching programs, and soon workshops, seminars, retreats, and festivals, all designed to empower you to live your best life. Ready to start your adventure? Join us at www.queerquest.vip to become part of a movement towards personal and collective greatness. Sign up today to join the waitlist and be the first to know when we launch. QueerQuest, where your journey of self-discovery and transformation begins. Don't just dream of a life filled with pride and purpose. Make it your reality with QueerQuest. Visit www.queerquest.vip now. Your quest awaits. Now, when I'm talking about this, you know, what is the difference between substance abuse and addiction? So really, substance abuse kind of involves, it's like the harmful use or hazardous use of, you know, substances like you know alcohol drugs things like that right there of course you know it, it can it can go into other areas but like you know prescription medication etc cetera, etc cetera. but like those are the kind of main things when you're you're abusing substances it's something like like alcohol drugs prescription medication right whereas an addiction on the other hand these are characterized by the inability to stop using those substances despite knowing the harmful consequences. Maybe like, you know, your brain waves are different to someone else. You have a d- physical dependency, like you might wake up and like you feel like I like you have all the withdrawals and you need to have whatever it is because you've been, you know, using it and your body's now changed its brain waves to feel like you absolutely need those periods, right? So yeah, if you can't stop yourself, you struggle with it and you have to abstain yourself from something because if you do start, you will like, you know, really go down a rabbit hole then that's probably more on the addiction side as well. So I, I, I'm trying to talk about the subject um, as touchy as possible because I am not an advocate for someone to, to, to go and use anything there, right? But I'm also not someone who's going to say, don't do something. Like, you know yourself best. But like, if you struggle with alcohol, if you struggle with illicit drugs, then and, and like, check to see, is this something that if you were to take, you would have a real problem and you'd go down to a dark, depression hole or can you take something and it'd be okay you can have some drinks and it's fine right because if it's not a problem for you it's not a problem in life as well right which is which you know sometimes is this this mental thing as well because like when I say if it's not a problem for you you're not going to do something about it right if you don't see yourself having the problem you won't do anything about it. that was me for many years was with the drinking because I was so in this world of like everyone's doing it and everyone gets wasted and does that like I would. I, I never saw it as a, a like too much of a problem for me to, to want to go fix. Of course, I would deal with the, some of the backlash, but I kept, you know, talking like d- being in denial and telling myself it's not a big deal. Whereas it was a big deal. It was affecting my life. It was affecting my relationships. It was affecting my work in some situations as well. And I needed to sort it out. And like I said, I've gone through the work and continue to do the work, so I'm in a good place, right? Because if something creeps up. I work on it early enough so that it doesn't become a bigger problem. If I have a bad day, definitely not going to go and go near drinking or anything else, right? For example, you know, like that's just not what I'm going to do. So again, I want people to be aware, like, you know, if you're struggling with addiction, like don't go, don't go and test the waters because of this conversation, right? But if you're, I'm not, and I'm also not saying if you're someone who's abused substances that you go and test the water either. I just trying to take away some of the stigma around this because 
I mislabeled myself as an alcoholic. And for me, that kind of put a lot of shame on me for, 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 for this so at some point. Of course, when I worked through it and got myself off it and I was able to, to, to go like a long period of time without it, I knew that I wasn't addicted to it because that period of time wasn't difficult for me. I wasn't struggling day by day, which is what a lot of people who go to AA feel like they have to, you know, like they struggle on a daily basis when it comes to, you know, whatever it is, alcohol, narcotics, illicit drugs, prescription medication, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those things there, like, I want, this is a journey that you have to go on yourself, but I also want to know that you could talk to people about it. Like, I, I talk to my clients about these things. Like, where are you at when it comes to your, your drinking or your substances? What are you taking? How does that affect your life? How are you feeling about those things? Is it something you want to work on? Is it something you want to work through? How's it affecting your life? How's it affecting you? How do you see yourself? Like all of these kinds of questions we talk through because I want people to have some autonomy in their decisions. And if you're in, a, if you're in the level where it's a substance abuse, you've got to work through those problems so that you no longer have to feel like you need to use those substances to numb or cope yourself with life. Because if you don't work through them, they're always going to be a problem, right? If you don't work through the real problem while you're actually going and abusing those substances, there'll be a time in your life where you fall back down and you go to them as well. That's what happened to me, right? And so same thing when it comes to having an addiction, if you're struggling with addiction, you have to continue, you, like you don't just give up the addiction and then the, the problems go away. You still have to work through whatever is in your life that's a problem. Like maybe this is making amends with, with the relationships that are broken and, and things like that, right? Because we all know the, the horror stories of people who, who really are, you know, struggled with, 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 with alcohol or drugs and how it's affected their family or their partners or things like that. And even some of my clients have had literal, you know, addicts in their, you know, in their relationships and it's caused chaos for their life as well and turned them into, you know, put, pull them down further because, you know, if you, it's hard to, 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 to date someone who's an alcoholic or an addict and not kind of get caught up in some of that spiral as well, you know? So, yeah, so, so like I said, to really understanding yourself where you're at when it comes to these things as well, because when it comes to this queer community, we are three times more likely to be abusing substances than the general population. And that kind of means that one in three queer people will suffer from substance abuse or even addictions as well. And of course that shows to us the higher in, you know, incidences of mental health issues so depression anxiety and you know other health conditions that affect us when it comes down to you know you know dealing with discrimination dealing with the internalized you know um feelings and homophobia or, or queerphobia or genderphobia that we deal with as well right or it could be the, the stigma that's around our community as well um and struggles that we might have with our family right all of this stuff you know, causes us to have higher mental health issues, which then leads to more substance abuse issues as well and ways of coping, right? Because that's the, the real reason is people are trying to cope with the stress or the trauma or the other, you know, emotions that they're dealing with and they turn to these substances, right? So like no one's a bad person for, 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 for going down that rabbit hole. But like I said, when it comes to like those harder drugs, like become really, really addictive and really can F up your entire life, it's like, what do we need to do to reduce some of those numbers? How can we help our community, help each other, and maybe make some changes so that mental health isn't so inaccessible? It becomes something that is accessible so that you can work through that with it, which is, you know, one of the main reasons why I've created QueerQuest, right? It's an online platform for health, healing, wellness, growth for people specifically in the queer community, where you're going to have queer voices from queer experts in all areas, so that if you're struggling in, in X, Y, Z area, it could be your health, it could be your relationships, it could be dating, it could be, you know, your self-worth, your mindset, your emotional state, right? All of these things, your, your family life, you can come there, you can learn from the experts, and you can go on the journey of healing. So this is a, a way for us to actually reduce the mental health issues, and then to also reduce the numbers of substance abuse and addictions in our community. Because I want to help people to, to rise up instead of to, to feel stuck where they are, right? There's a huge epidemic of loneliness in our community. 70% of people in the queer community state that they are having long-term loneliness for a period of time in their life, right? So if we can work on reducing that, we can reduce the mental health, we can reduce the substance abuses as well. And it's about, like I said, creating a space where you feel more connected to your community.
How can you feel more connected to the community? Quick Quest were building a great tribe of people who are part of the queer community as well. So, you know, what are some other factors that are going to affect people as well? Like, for example, like I said, I know that not every single sex subsection of the queer community is going to have the same numbers, right? So, like I said, gay, lesbian, um, you know, um, transgender, non-binary, like if, depending on where you are, like there's going to be some differences, right? Because again, like as we've evolved over time, it has like things have gotten better for different subsections of our community, right? Like it is better, you know, for people who are, you know, gay or lesbian today than it was 20 years ago. And of course it's, you know, we're still working towards that for people who are in the transgender community or like going on that gender journey because there are some people who are out there who have a lot of hatred for that. And so because of that, you know, that can lead to, you know, more likelihood of you being, you know, struggling with, with, with different substances or even going into the addiction area. So, you know, reaching out and finding resources that are going to be supportive of you is important. And it's about making awareness of these, these, these places so that you can get the right support as well. Because, you know, we don't want people struggling with, with living on the streets with the, you know, the constant use of, you know, of things around and that's not going to be healthy for them to get caught up in that area as well, right? You know, it's all, all so easy, like, to go down a spiral and take one step and then you're down 10 of them, right? So let's try to figure out a way that we can go up one step and get you up 10 as well, you know, because that's what we'd rather be able to do, you know? So, again, if you're in the, the queer community and you're, like, part of other communities, like that intersectionality thing, right, you know, people of colour and queer people of colour, right? Like, you're, like, a, a person who is, you know, from, uh, you know, a predominantly white background and queer it's going to have it easier than a someone who's from, you know, say, you know, the Asian community with, 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 with when it comes to their families or, you know, the, the, the African-American community, right? Like all of these factors will play a big difference in it. And so we need to focus on understanding like it, just, you know, you growing up as a queer person, but also a queer person of color or whatnot, these things can change and affect you. And so we, it's not just working on, you as a queer person, we're working on you as a human being because a lot of those other factors can affect your level of that. And the numbers, like I said, the more you know, you go down in the, the the levels of multiculturalism and you put subsections together, the more you become a minority. The the the, the rate, the higher rates of you know, mental health and substance abuse issues come about. So we again have to really understand these things and work on those to be able to to to, to, to be able to get through that as well. You know, I know that, you know, when we look at it, like the stuff that we need to work on, you know, politically, socially, you know, there's a lot of advocacy that we need to be able to do to create better support systems, to create better health systems, to work through the stigma of people who are, you know, who are substance abuse users, right? Like, you know, I know like it's gotten better, you know, but over the years, like mental health was not a conversation you would have 10, 15 years ago. Um talking about, you know, personal development and growth, again, like there wasn't a lot of people doing those kinds of things. Now it's a lot more talked about, but still the stigma around people who are, you, you know, substance abuse users, whether it's an alcoholic or, you know, a, you know someone who's utilizing drugs in, in, in ways, instead of going, like, what is going on? Why is that person in that position to, 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 to feel they need to use those things? Instead of, it's more of a like, oh my God, they're they're like, what's wrong with them? They're like, and there's a signal of like them being a bad person and they're going to, you know, do something bad to me. Where it's just, that's just not always the case. People just sometimes are in, caught themselves up in a bad situation and they've now like, this is their coping me mechanism. So we need to figure out what we can do to, to help these people to have better coping mechanisms. Now I have a lot better coping mechanisms, right? One of my main coping mechanisms is giving myself space to go to, the, the spa and go to the you know the the sauna and the steam room and the ice bath and just allow myself each day that 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 is self care that helps me to reduce my stress right I go for a walk on the beach you know walk my dogs you know spend time talking through my emotions with friends or my partner right these are better ways of me dealing with it than glug 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 or or you know or whatever the the choice may be so really trying to like have this understanding that for us as a community, what is the difference? Where are you at when it comes to this? Is this something you've dealt with in the past? Is this something you're currently dealing with? Have you had to struggle through your understanding of, you know, are you an addict or are you abusing substances? What are the reasons for that? You know, 
feel free to share that with me. Reach out to me on social media. Like I said, anyone who reaches out to me privately, I always support them. I try to help them, give them resources, or like lead them in the right direction if I can't specifically help you. So feel free to share your story with me. Reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, you know, or even comment below if this is if you feel like sharing your story publicly as well. I'm sure someone reading the comments would love to hear something if you feel, you know, drawn to doing that as well. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I feel like we've had a good conversation today. I'm going to be back next week with another episode. But until then, always remember, it's time for you to actually like, comment, and subscribe as well, by the way. Um, but always remember that you've got this and I've got you. Bye for now. Are you ready to embark on a transformative journey towards love and happiness? Introducing the 21 Day Gaiman's Guide to Love and Happiness. This isn't just a course, it's a pathway to discovering your true self, overcoming challenges and embracing happiness. Join hundreds of gay men who found joy and freedom. Learn from Cristiano Green, a coach with 20 years experience and a journey like yours. For a limited time, get this life-changing course at 75% off with a 100% risk-free guarantee. There's nothing to lose, but so much to gain. Your new life is just a click away. Enroll in the 21-day Gay Men's Guide to Love and Happiness today. Visit theglobalpridecollective.com and start your journey towards a happier, more fulfilled you.